Hi, friends. I'm John Kempf, hosting this podcast. I am passionate about developing regenerative agriculture systems that improve soil health, produce crops that are completely resistant to diseases and insects, and produce fruit of such an exceptional quality that we can have a legitimate conversation about growing food as medicine. I've discovered that there are many people with incredible knowledge and information about soil and plant systems and how to develop regenerative agriculture systems. However, much of this knowledge and this information is scattered. It's found all over the place. Some of it has been published in peer-reviewed publications, but there are many incredible stories and a lot of knowledge that has not been published and that hasn't been shared with many people. I started Advancing Eco-Agriculture in 2006 to bring this knowledge together in a more coherent fashion and incorporate it into products and growing systems that growers can easily put into practice. It's my personal mission to have these regenerative agricultural systems become adopted globally and become the mainstream, the status quo, against which all other growing systems are compared. To help achieve this goal, I want to share the knowledge that we have learned in the last decade and make it available to everyone. While we have developed products at AEA that embody the principles of regenerative agriculture systems and make them easier for growers to apply, this knowledge and these principles can be applied anywhere. And when they are applied properly, they will always increase farm profitability and resilience to climate stress. If you have any questions, suggestions, comments, or ideas, topics that you would like for me to discuss, please connect on LinkedIn or on Twitter, where my username is at VisionBuilder7. Or you can also email me at uh, john at johnkempf.com. I would very much like to hear from you and to hear your feedback. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast. And thank you very much for listening. Enjoy the show. Well, greetings, friends, and welcome to the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast. On this podcast, we work to explore the science of growing really exceptional crops and to describe why you have crop challenges and how we can resolve them. Our goal is to give you really clear and easy to understand and actionable information that we can actually implement in the field. Many of us as growers have had experiences where we have these unusual and intriguing observations where we observe that we have major pest problems in one part of a field, but not in another part of the field that has been managed in exactly the same way. Or we grow a given variety of a crop in two fields with the essentially the exact same management and same types of products being applied, and yet we sometimes get completely different results, uh, sometimes dramatically different results, where we get much higher yields in one field or in one section of a field than we do elsewhere. Why is that? Why is that happening? And how can we replicate that level of success over a much broader area? These are the types of questions that we work to unravel and unwrap and really understand why, what's going on, how things are happening, and how we can replicate that level of success on a much larger scale. So today, I'm excited to welcome onto the podcast, Michael McNeil. Michael is one of these wise elders of agriculture. Uh, Michael has been a very close mentor, uh, as I have been learning about crops and growing amazing crops in the agricultural field and has also become a very close friend. Michael has a very impressive background in agronomy, uh, has a degree in plant physiology and in genetics, and has spent a very long and very successful career in the Midwest working with many growers on a broad range of different challenges and has a very interesting background. So Michael, welcome to the show. We're excited to have you here. Thank you, John. It's fun to be here. Michael, can you can we perhaps begin by understanding a little bit more of your work? Can you begin by giving us telling us a little bit about your background and the work that you are doing on a day to day basis on your operation? Well, I, I was born and raised on a farm uh, northwest of Algona, Iowa, and I'm still farming that farm today. I have I've watched it go from pretty much uh, all horses and horse-drawn equipment to our modern-day tractors that are uh, GPS-guided across the field. So it's been quite a transition that I've gotten to see, and I, I, I've, I've learned a lot along the way. I have had the fortune, I guess, to see that kind of farming, and I 
see perhaps a need to return to a portion of what my grandfather was doing back in those days. And uh, I don't necessarily mean uh, we got to sell our tractors and buy horses, but some of the things that he did to improve soil health and maintain soil fertility are things that we really need to be thinking about today. In my operation, I've uh, the past couple of years have decided to go totally organic with it, which makes it a bit unusual, but somewhat commonplace for around our community. We have, I think uh, the last numbers I saw was uh, around uh, 42,000 acres of organic crop in the two county area here where I live. Wow, that's grown quite substantially. It's a huge change. And uh, I know that there is a uh, sort of a, a stigma if, if when you talk about organic farmers, many times they think of the guy that's farming a 20 or 40 acre patch that's just covered with weeds. And uh, the farmers in our community that we're working with range all the way from uh, half section, 320 acres of land, to 15,000 acres of land. And they're pretty much weed-free. Very, very excellent farmers. Uh, they've learned a lot about weed management, weed control, soil fertility, soil health. So I'm pretty excited to see that change. But it does remind me a bit of the things that my grandfather taught me years and years ago. Um, and that's the way he took care of his crops. So I, I really, I want to, I want to circle back and, and dig into that a bit more. But before we go there, can you tell us a little bit about your professional work and what you do professionally in addition to the farming operation? Okay. Uh, well, I left the farm for a few years and uh, went through, uh, I guess it's called formal education at Iowa State University. Uh, where I majored in agronomy, uh, got my BS degree in, in soils, in soil fertility, and uh, then I, I became quite interested in how that impacted plant growth. So I had my master's degree in plant physiology, and then I was intrigued with how genetics worked and how the environment impacted on genetics. So I ended up getting my PhD in quantitative genetics, and uh, along that same path, I, I also became interested in, in plant diseases and had a minor in plant pathology. And uh, after leaving the university, I spent some time with a, a facility uh, located in Frederick, Maryland, where we studied uh, the impact of diseases that could be used as a weapon and how we could defend our crops against that type of thing and learned a great deal about how fertility and genetics and uh, things like that create a envir an environment that uh, we can protect ourselves from any pathogenic invasion, if you will. Wow, oh, that sounds intriguing. And then where did that lead you from there? Well, I became a corn breeder and uh, I worked for a, a major company uh, for 12 years, managing a uh, corn breeding research station. I started their soybean breeding uh, project as well as continuing the, the corn breeding project. I did that for about 12 years. And during that time, farmers would ask me probably more fertility and soil fertility questions than they did genetic questions. And uh, I kept trying to explain the, the, how the two kind of worked together. And uh, that was about the time that uh, GMOs were being invented, and we were using gene guns and uh, blasting gold dust through genes and trying to move them from one thing into another thing. And we started taking genes out of different species and, and moving them around, taking genes out of bacteria and putting them in a corn plant. And that whole thing uh, really didn't fit with my, uh, uh, I, I guess, thoughts about how our species were created and why they were created and who was man to mix with them 
and we're to opening Pandora's box to who knows what when you started doing that. And so I chose to step out of that type of breeding work, uh, sticking still mainly with my quantitative genetics approach versus uh, the gene gun approach, and uh, got more into soil health, soil fertility, and genotype by fertility interactions. And that led me into a profession of agricultural consulting. I started working with farmers and explaining how all this worked, and it got to be a pretty exciting adventure. I started uh, with a farmer. He had 160 acres, and then his neighbor added another 160 to it, and uh, I'm now up to about 165,000 acres that I work on. So that's sort of a, a history of how I got to where I am today. And when you say you have a, about 165,000 acres that you work on today, what is what is the scope of the work that you do on each of these farms? Most of it is working with soil health and soil fertility and helping them select the, the right genetics for the fertility programs that they're working with. Soil health is becoming a bigger and bigger issue for me to deal with. When I first started, it wasn't a, a really big issue. It's huge now. And so I'm devoting more of my time now to soil health than that I ever thought I would. So I'd, I'd love to talk about that a little bit. When you say that soil health didn't used to be a big issue, now you're spending a lot of time on that. What what has changed with soil health? How is how how do you how are you managing it differently today from what you needed to 20 or 30 years ago? Well, interesting that you would ask me that, John. I uh, the other day I was cleaning out a drawer in my desk, and I found some old pictures that that I had taken uh, back uh, uh, 1972, 1973 of crops that were growing. I had some close-ups and some kind of overviews of the field. And the thing that I noticed was how healthy the, the plants were. There were no disease lesions on them anywhere. Corn, the corn plants were just perfect. And the whole field was that way. And it's really hard to find a field today that is that way. And I got to looking at the weeds that were growing along the fence rows. And they were big and healthy and looked great. And they don't look so good today, comparatively speaking. And you say, well, maybe that's a good thing. No, it's not. The whole area that we're farming is unhealthy. And so I asked them, the question, well, what's changed? And what I really see the big difference being from that era until today is that farmers have been drawn into, well, I guess I call it big ag, and you need to use herbicides. You don't want to use a cultivator. You got to get over more land. So you use herbicides and, and these herbicides then are doing things to the soil because they're all chelators. So now, the plants become a little bit imbalanced in the nutrition that they're taking up, and you find more disease. You find more insect pressures. So we start using fungicides and insecticides, more chelators, more poisons being dumped onto the ground. And we were pretty impressed with how they work. Boy, the field was perfectly clean, weed-free, excellent. The diseases were dramatically reduced. The fungicides work really well. The, the corn borers and some other the insects that were issues went away. It was magic. The chemistry was totally magic and looked beautiful. But as time went on, it started poisoning the good things that were in the soil. And so today, I am called out to look at farms where the guy's production has dropped off dramatically. And the soil is virtually dead. When you say the production has, has dropped off dramatically, what, what have you observed? Um, what I have seen is looking at 10-year crop insurance records, the guy was getting 190 to 210 bushel per acre, had around a 200 bushel 10-year average. Excellent, excellent yields. Now it's getting 70 and 80 bushel yields. Wow. That's dramatic. 
and will put him out of business very quickly. That is very dramatic. I ha this isn't like oh this is a little field here or a farm there. I mean I'm seeing eight and ten thousand acre farms that this has happened to, and uh, that really really woke me up. I started seeing this about five years ago, so I've been working with these growers and can I remediate that? Can I bring it back? And in a three to four year period, we've had pretty good success. I would say we're back. We're back now into uh, where we were when this crashed. But the farmers are excited that they can now take it to a different yield plateau in the 250 bushel range or, or greater. And they can see growth and potential in doing what they're doing. And they've moved, moved away from GMO crops and particularly moved away from the use of glyphosate. So I think these are the very important pieces for us to to talk about and to understand, Michael, is when, when you have a degraded, and so the question that I have is when you have a degraded system like that, where you have suppressed yields and suppressed soil health, as you're describing it, how do you go from a depressed yields of 70 to 90 bushels per acre back up to 200 with aspirations of going back up to 250 bushels per acre? How, how do you achieve that? Well... It's it's a long hard task really. There's no silver bullets. You got to kind of figure out what all what all was going wrong and stop doing that. Number one. Number two, you're going to have to look at at what is it going to take to remediate the soil. Is is it, is the soil become really hard? Just and I mean hard like a road. I get penetrometer readings. It takes 500 pounds of down pressure to penetrate the top two inches of the soil, that's hard. That's just like a gravel road. It's just, well, a crop will not grow on that. When, they, when they're tilling it, it's breaking up into chunks. And then when it rains, it puddles and it just seals over. And so we get no oxygen into the soil. So you have to maybe incorporate some tillage things and then start getting some food for the microbial life that's almost non-existent it's not non-existent because you can bring it back and that's the good news if you don't let this thing go too long you can bring it back now whether we're bringing all of it back or not i don't know but once you start get it started coming back then you can look at inoculating with mycorrhizae and some of the things that the pseudomona has the, the tenomycetes that could be missing and get them stimulated to growing but you gotta first get the oxygen in the soil, get the water working correctly, get the food right before you, there's no magic in inoculating the soil if, you're, if it's loaded with poison, it'll just kill your inoculant. So you gotta kind of fix that problem first before you try inoculating and getting, and in inoculation, you wouldn't have to do that, but it does speed it up. You gain about a year, maybe two years when you do that. So earlier, yeah, I see people thinking they're buying a magic silver bullet and inoculating and, and then continuing to do the things that caused it to die in the first place. And they're not winning, they're losing. So let, let's go back to that for just a moment because you've, you've iterated several times that you have to stop doing what inflicted the damage in the first place. When you were, uh, from my summary, what I heard you saying uh, just in synopsis was that it's really the herbicides and the fungicides, the insecticide applications that are causing this degradation of soil health. And I heard you mention that these herbicides, these various pesticides that people are applying are actually chelation agents. I guess the question that I have is, why do you believe that these products are the causal agent for the suppression of soil health? Couldn't it also be the extensive tillage that we had for a number of decades and some of these other contributing factors? Well, I, I have some farms that I feel are way over tilled. They're organic farmers. They really do what I almost feel as excessive tillage. Doesn't seem to be bothering the soil at all. It isn't quite as good as I'd like to see it, but as long as they're keeping their organic matter up, preventing erosion, uh, using cover crops and that sort of thing, 
the tillage in itself doesn't seem to be doing as much damage as I originally thought. Now, having said that, you have to be careful which tillage tools you use. A disc is not a very good tillage tool to be using. It causes compaction. It fractures the soil structure uh, much worse than a tined implement that would you could pull through it, whether that be a, I call it a tined implement, but a V-ripper, a, a narrow-pointed field cultivator, not a sweep. Uh, these kinds of things do not seem to do the structural damage that I see with uh, things like a, a disc or even a, like a moldboard plow or a, a field cultivator with sweeps on it. So in, in essence, you're saying that tillage doesn't have the damaging effects on soil health as the herbicides do from your perspective. Not as bad as the herbicides, not as bad as anhydrous ammonia, and not as bad as the high salt fertilizers. They tend to be more of an issue. And when you put them all together, it overwhelms the the soil life system that's going on. So I... I... I guess I understand the impact of anhydrous ammonia and salt fertilizers. Obviously, both of those are very oxidizing and can have the potential to produce a lot of damage to the soil's microbial community and to organic matter and so forth. But I don't understand that herbicides would have that same effect. So you mentioned the herbicides being chelation <laughs> agents. I guess the question that I have is, from your perspective, how... How is it that herbicides and these various pesticides have such a damaging effect on soil health? Well, we have not paid a lot of attention to micronutrients in the soil. Micronutrients are extremely important to plant growth, and they are readily chelated and easily chelated by the the pesticides that we use. And once you tie those up, you start shutting down significant pathways, and that's where my my physiology training and background, it kind of came into play when I started seeing a lot of these physiological processes being shut down. You know, for example, uh, one that probably is pretty familiar to a lot of people is if you chelate manganese and tie that up, you shut down the shikimic pathway. When you shut that down, then diseases can move in very quickly because that's sort of the plant's immune system, if you will. You shut that down, then you have to buy fungicides. And you put on the fungicides to protect from disease that's invaded that. And then you start killing more of the fungal life in the soil. And it's a vicious, vicious cycle that you set up. You mentioned you believe that perhaps we should go back to some of the practices that you learned from your grandfather. What are the things that you learned from him that you think would be relevant and appropriate today? Well, one of the things was he was very good at crop rotation. And we've gotten ourselves into, as I'd almost call it a monoculture, a biculture, if you will, where we go corn and soybeans, or soybeans and corn, or corn and soybeans. It's just that's not working well with the soil microbial life. And uh, back in the day, he he was using horses, so he needed feed for those horses. He raised those. Oats have a real good way of cleansing the soil, bringing more silica available for plant growth, taking toxins out of the soil. And so he was keeping the soil clean just because he needed to produce fuel for his, for his power. Well, we don't need that today. So I get a lot of guys, well, why do, why do I grow oats? I, I don't need to grow oats. And I say, well, Think about that as an excellent cover crop. So plant those, get them growing. The winter will kill the oat plant, so you don't have to use a herbicide to kill it in the spring. And you've got all these good benefits. You've you've retained nutrition in the soil. You've retained the nitrogen. You've gotten a very fibrous root system that is going to improve the soil structure. Plenty of food there for microbial life. You're going to have some suppression of weeds in the spring with that cover that you have there from the oats. So, yeah, we can still use that that crop today. We can rotate, but think about using it as a cover crop. He also 
you know, grew clovers and alfalfas and other legumes that, that uh, of course, benefited the nitrogen for production of the corn. Can we do that? Yes, we can. But we need to change the way we, we look at, at our land. We have a need for livestock in the cropping areas. And we've kind of taken them out because it's, it's, you can grow huge numbers of cattle, cattle feedlots better in a warmer climate. And that's true. But then you're shipping all that nu- nutrient into that area where it's more of a waste product than it is a fertilizer. And there is no better fertilizer than animal manures. Michael, we've been talking about, you know, we've been circling around this topic of soil health and the impacts of tillage and herbicides, animal manures, cover crops, and so forth. If I heard you correctly, at the beginning, you mentioned there is a correlation between soil health and the diseases that are present. And if I heard you correctly, you mentioned some work that you were doing in Maryland uh, studying diseases as a weapon. What did you learn from that experience, and how does all of that tie into what we are talking about? Well, if you, for example, let's just pull an example out of the air. Let's say you want to use a fungal disease you know, as a weapon, and you can get that introduced into the soil, and not only does it kill the crop this year, it'll continue to kill it into future years. So, hey, that's a pretty good weapon. You shut down the people's food supply, they have a problem. Well, if you have good pseudomonads, the pseudomonas uh, bacteria in the soil, they kind of act as a policeman in the soil, if you will, and they'll take out the excess pathogenic fungi that can arise. But if you use products like glyphosate, that's a antibiotic type product, you're going to kill all the pseudomonads. And so then you have no protection. And it's very easy to get a huge population of fusarium going in the soil, which probably is a pathogenic uh, fusarium or pythium or phytophthora. Uh, you've lost the natural balance that keeps everything in balance. And so if you have that balance present, inoculating it with a pathogenic fungi is not going to do much for you. It'll just clean it right up. Wow. So you can actually have a disease suppressive soil where you don't have challenges with those. But I, I, I think I also heard you mention that you were working on developing solutions to those diseases as weapons. What were the types of solutions that you were working on? Well, uh, I mean, there's all kinds of approaches. Uh, if you need a fast cure, you know, of course, you're going to look at chemistry and the fungicides and that sort of thing. But what you find is if you get the soil contaminated, how do you fix that? Because if you put anything on that, you're going to kill everything in the soil. Using a soil sterile is not necessarily a great idea. And so what you do is there are thing microbial life in the soil that will hold everything in balance. And so if you have the right nutrition available, those will develop and then everything will take care of itself. It's sort of, I, I, I'll use you as an analogy, John. If, if your nutrition gets pretty poor, you're going to get pretty run down and you're going to be very susceptible to all kinds of diseases. Would you agree? Oh, I think that's just the, the story of the people who are trying to sell me supplements. <laughs> yeah, no, right. no, I'm making a joke. Yeah, and I that's the story of, uh, I, I understand. <laughs> but um, when that occurs, you can say, okay, well, I'm going to take this supplement or this drug to prevent me from this disease. But you're still improperly nourished. You're going to get another disease. And then you're going to get another disease. But if I get your nutrition back and properly balanced and everything at correct levels, your immune system then starts to function properly. And a good share of your immune system is in your digestive tract. A lot of microbes working for you. And so the soil is no different. You get those microbes working for you, you're going to stay healthy. Are you the soil is going to stay that, healthy and so are the plants. Are you saying that when you manage the nutritional balance of the soil and the microbial population of the soil that it's possible to 
grow crops that don't have disease? Yes. When a plant is perfectly healthy, it's very hard to get a disease to invade it. And an insect will not even stop to look at it. Why is that? It's because an unhealthy plant cannot convert the sugars that it's produced into complex sugars, starches, and lignin, which insects and diseases can't use. They can only use the simple sugars, the nitrate nitrogens in the plant. The nitrate nitrogen is taken up by the plant, gets converted into amino acids and proteins immediately in a healthy plant. In an unhealthy plant, a plant that does not have the right mineral balance to make all those processes and cycles work will have a pretty heavy load of nitrate in it. Fantastic food for the insect. They can detect that and they will land on that plant and feed on that plant. So yes. really disease and insects are Mother Nature's garbage collectors. They're getting rid of the bad stuff, the weak plants. Yeah, these are pieces that we have spoken about and that I've spoken about quite extensively in uh, describing some of the things that we've observed happening where we develop this diagram called the plant health pyramid where we describe how plants become resistant to different types of diseases and different types of insect pests at different stages of physiological development. So that's right. something that we've observed in the field very clearly and it's it's really exciting and a lot of fun when it starts functioning the way that it was designed to function because all of a sudden disease and insect pressure dramatically reduces and in many cases you can say that it completely disappears and that's that's really exciting that's a lot of fun it really is and that's yeah. what takes me way back into the early years when i looked at the plants and they were not having any of these issues the micronutrient levels were excellent all the processes were functioning properly and there's very little disease or insect pressure yeah, it's, it's certainly, it's very interesting to hear your perspective over time of how things have changed over a 40-year, 50-year time period. And I didn't really realize how much it had changed until I pulled out those photos and was looking at them the other day. It was just like, wow, it's really, really different. You don't suppose that those photos are just the one-off of a really exceptional year? No, they were, they were not taken for that reason. Uh, some of these photos were taken of uh, pictures of livestock that were going to be sold, and they were standing you know, in the field or by a fence, and I was just kind of looking beyond that and looking at the crop. Wow, check that out. You know, Otherwise, if there's a photo that was taken of an exceptionally good crop or something, I would say, yes, you have a point. But no, these photos were taken of and focused on other things, and the crop was in the background. But as I observed it, it's like, check that out. It's really looking good. Wow. Well, Michael, there are, there are a number of different areas in, in your expertise and your background that we haven't had the chance to explore deeply yet. So I'm going to move on to a bit of a different question. Um, what has been something that you puzzled over for a really long time until you and trying to figure something out? What has been something that really caught your attention? in the agriculture space that you've been working on? Well, something that I've already then finally figured out, I think, was the impact of the lack of availability of the micronutrients in our crops. You know, I mean, it was, yeah, it was kind of, yeah, we should know about that. But until I figured out why that was occurring, I couldn't quite figure out what happened because I was doing tissue testing, for example. I had adequate copper and iron and manganese and magnesium and calcium. Everything looked good. What I didn't realize was a lot of those minerals were chelated and tied up into a form that the plant could not use, but yet showed up on a chemistry test when we tested the, the tissue. And when I finally figured that out, then it, everything started to, to gel for me. So I, th I think what you're saying is that the, these various minerals and trace minerals were being chelated inside the plant tissue by herbicides and fungicides that growers were applying? Yes. And so when I test them, test the plants, well, they, they had adequate levels. But yeah, when I looked at the plant, it, it, had, it was showing deficiency symptoms. 
I, I mean, you could look at that and say, well, that, that's a zinc deficiency or that's a manganese deficiency, just obvious. But when I tested, it was fine. You know, I, why is that? And it's when I learned about this chelation issue and how it can be such a problem. Yeah, this is something that we've been monitoring and paying attention to for a number of years. And we believe it, it seems that in some cases with SAP analysis, uh, it reports those a bit more accurately, but uh, and perhaps doesn't take all the chelation into account. But of course, it's still extracting nutrients that are held within the plant sap, and it's still possible for them to be chelated. So we do see the SAP analysis correlate more accurately to what the plants are actually yeah. showing visually than I, I would agree. Yeah. I, I would agree. I think the SAP analysis has been a, a, a good step forward, but until I kind of figured out this chelation effect, that's when it really gelled for me and I could understand why I was seeing deficiency symptoms and what looked like on paper to be an appropriately healthy plant. Yeah, got it. What do you believe to be true about modern agriculture? that many other people don't believe to be true. We've been talking about a number of different things that you, you seem to have a very different framework and uh, a very different model of thinking about what is happening in soils and plants. And so I, I'm just trying to understand the, the fundamentals and the foundational principles behind that. What are the things that you believe to be true that many other people don't believe to be true? I believe that the, the, the soil can grow an extremely healthy, high-yielding plant with minimal additions of inputs. The, 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 there's plenty of minerals in the soil if you treat it properly. And I think you'd find most people would disagree with me with that. We have proven you have to put on fertilizers to get good yields. Wow. I, I'm going to stick with that. Because I, I, I've proven it to myself that you can do that. So you're saying that you can actually grow healthy, high-yielding crops without adding fertilizers? Yes. So how do you do that? How does that work? That's a complex question <laughs> and a very complex like a very... answer. <laughs> if, that, if that were real simple... Uh, I'd have to charge you for this information. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's creating the healthy soil that allows the plant roots to go deep in, into the soil to extract the minerals that it needs. I mean, it's a vast sea of minerals available. And if you're starting to see suppression of crop yield and then you add fertilizer and the yield comes back, that's because you're only using the top uh, a few inches, if you will, of the soil. Uh, the roots are not healthy enough to penetrate deeper to actually mine the minerals that are there. I mean, all of our soil is nothing but minerals. So this is something that I've talked about as well. And the question that I often get is, aren't you going to deplete the soil of minerals if you're not adding fertilizers? Well, my quick reply to that is always, yeah, that's like trying to take all the salt out of the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right. Well. But you can deplete it. You can deplete it in a rooting zone, and I'll, I'll grant you that. But what you need to do is it be, expand your ability to, to search in a bigger rooting zone. And you need to, to add mycorrhizae into that equation because you want a really big rooting zone, let the mycorrhizae work for you. Oh, this, uh, I think this is a much bigger topic that we perhaps need to unwrap at some point in the future, but this is... I think you're what, right, but it is an exciting one. It's a very exciting one. The, the idea that we can grow really healthy crops without constantly adding inputs. I mean, when... When we talk about developing regenerative agriculture ecosystems, today there's a lot of discussion about sustainability. And I've made the comment that we can't have a legitimate conversation about sustainability and, and a sustainable agriculture as long as we are constantly importing such large volumes of inputs that we first need to have a regenerative model where we regenerate soil health and plant health to a much higher plateau of performance. And only at that point, can we have a true conversation about sustainability? And so for me, this is, this is really exciting because what you are describing 
is really the foundation of what I would describe as true sustainability. That's correct. I'm going to circle back and I want to come back to that piece and explore it a little bit more. But uh, I'd love to also ask the the counterpoint of the question that I asked, which which brought out that answer, which is, what is it that you do not believe to be true that many other people do believe to be true? Well, it's, as I think about that, it's almost the same question in a sense and that most people believe that you have to put a lot of inputs in in order to get a decent yield. And they're not understanding how the system works. The, orig- the, the way the system will work is not what we're trying to do today. We're trying to, I don't know, we're trying to swim upstream with it, and it's just not working. Yeah, there certainly is. I would agree with you that we are, we're trying to, we're trying to force things to move in a direction that they don't naturally want to flow. And when we get, I mean, we can talk about science, the science behind developing exceptionally healthy crops, and we can make it sound really complicated. But at the end of the day, the reality is that it was designed to work, and it did work very successfully for a very long period of time. And if we can give it the framework and the management that it needs to really flow well, then it can work very effectively. We just need to allow that to happen. Yes, I agree. What technology or ideas, what, what are you really excited about? What are you excited about in the future of agriculture? I think probably uh, one of the big things is getting more involved in food production. We're, we, we've done a lot of work with our corn soybean game, if you will, and we've tried to make foods out of that. And many of these foods are not necessarily very healthy for us. And I think if we started concentrating on food production, agriculture has a fantastic opportunity here. When we're wasting some of the best soils on earth, produce fuel for our vehicles, (laughs) we're really missing it. So just a moment ago, you mentioned the word opportunity, opportunity. So what, where do you see the big opportunities in agriculture today? I see the most success right now in growers that are looking to improve sustainability of their farming operations. And when they do that, they're finding that they're relying on less and less inputs. They're having higher quality food and feed production at a lower cost, and they are profitable. In a time when right right now, agriculture is struggling in profitability right now. It really is. But those growers are not struggling at all. So in your assessment, the opportunity for growers is really to develop sustainability and reduce inputs so that they can become more profitable. Is that what you're saying? Yes. If you were to recommend to growers to learn more about these various pieces that you are talking about, what is, what is the one book that you would recommend the most often? What, what is one resource that you would recommend to most people, different growers, to, to learn more about? Well, a book that I, that I really like is Mineral Nutrition and Plant Disease that was edited uh, by Lawrence Datnoff, Wade Elmer, and Don Huber. I find that to be a, a really useful book in helping you understand how minerals affect plants. And when you get a feel for that and how that all works, then all these things that you and I have talked about for the last hour, all of a sudden start making a lot of sense. So that's a pretty good book to start with. Yeah, it certainly is one of the, in terms of agri- agronomic sciences and so forth, it's, I would say it's in the top two or three that I personally reference the most often. So it definitely is mm-hmm. a very valuable resource. And I think for people who haven't done anything, that that's a really a pretty decent one to start with. And then once, Once they sort of have that under their belt, then they can start delving into some of the books. And I don't have a particular one in mind to talk about the microbial life in the soil and what it takes to improve that. Now, there was actually a... Because once you're doing the, once you're doing the plants, the the rest of that sort of, it all falls into place for you. Yeah, the plants are certainly the, the engine, the photosynthetic engine that drives soil biology for certain. There's a really great book that was written, that was um, published 
back in the 70s, if I'm not mistaken, um, by the Russian Academy of Sciences uh, titled Soil Microorganisms and Higher Plants um, by N.A. Krasilnikov. And uh, we actually have a PDF of that that we make available on our website at Advancing Eco Agriculture. That is incredibly powerful, incredibly insightful reading. It's, uh, it's a fairly in-depth book, but it's, it's kind of amazing both how much we have already learned back then 40 years ago and how much we have failed to put into practice. There's a lot of knowledge there that we haven't applied consistently in commercial scale production agriculture for sure. Michael, what is the one action that you would advise that all growers should take right now? They should take immediately. What's the one thing that people can do to make the biggest difference on their operations? Stop poisoning the soil. I guess that was easy. <laughs> Real simple. Just stop. So that that sounds simple. It sounds easy to do, but how how do you manage oh, well, that if you're if you're applying? it's a challenge to do. Uh, if you spent most of your life doing that, stopping it is not necessarily easy. Are there? But it's are the there's... one action they need to do to be successful. Are there? transition steps that can be taken to kind of move away from that? What are, what are some of your growers doing that have moved away from using herbicides and so forth? I would say I have a full array of uh, actions from taking baby steps to jumping off the cliff and just 100% stop. And I have seen growers from anywhere from the smaller three, 400 acre growers to the 10 to 15,000 acre growers step off the cliff and have it work really well for them. I was really concerned about some of the larger growers, but I found that they had they had the management ability and the resources to really make it happen. And once they understood what they were doing and why they were doing it, they could be very successful. So are you suggesting And I think that... that's something that most people don't believe. Because I, I mean I get that thrown in my face almost every day. Well, I, I can't do that. I have that's too I have too big an operation. I can't do that. Um, and I, I just really enjoy throwing it back while I know somebody who has. <laughs> and, well, and then they have not really changed. They have not necessarily added more hired men or anything. The one thing that they have added is that if they make a mistake or a failure, they've had to employ a large number of people for a short period of time to hand weed a field. You know, if, they, if they made a mistake, that's the only fix there is. So this is actually, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with this a little bit myself. As, wait, wait, so when you say that, when you use the words stepping off a cliff, are you talking about eliminating 100% of all herbicide applications right out of the gate? What does that mean exactly? All pesticide applications. Aren't you going to lose your crop to potential disease and insect pests when you do that? When you do that, you better have read that book that I just suggested so that you understand that you have the right micronutrient balance to keep that plant healthy enough to protect itself. So I and you can I, do that through through you know starter fertilizers, foliar feeding, multiple foliar feedings, and you can pull it off. So what what have been some of the failures of growers who have tried to do this, and what have been what has been their degree of success as well? By and large, I've had all successes. I'm trying to think of a, a failure. I, I, I really don't think of any. But I make sure that they really understand and know what they're doing when they do it. I've had a few where they missed a field or two timing-wise. You know, a rain caught them and they didn't get in and get it taken care of when they should have. They have some weed issues that haunted them a little bit. But uh, they were able to get it cleaned up to the point where it did not suppress yield. Wow. How... So, how how do their yields? I think that there? their yields have been going up. That's what's been somewhat shocking, you know. And I, I want to be sure that that's attributed to to that, not just necessarily a good growing season, because we've had some good growing seasons recently. But uh, their yields have continued to climb quite quite rapidly. They've moved to a different yield plateau. So you're saying that their yields are actually higher now than they were when they were using herbicides and pesticides regularly. Yes. Well, that's exciting because that's exactly, those are the same types of things that we've observed in the fruit and vegetable production world. And those are really the types of 
regenerative systems that we seek to create and to establish. And I absolutely agree with you that those are possible. I think the one piece that we, from a management perspective, often do a bit differently on, on the fruit and vegetable crops that we are working on is we don't usually advise people to step off the cliff, to borrow your terminology, but rather to manage nutrition and to regenerate soil health to a higher plateau of performance where we kind of earn the right to eliminate pesticides, where all of a sudden we don't have problems with powdery mildew anymore. We don't have problems with spider mites anymore. We don't have problems with leaf hoppers anymore. And so when we get to that much higher plateau performance and we no longer have the problems, then we start cutting and eliminating pesticide applications. So it, uh, it seems a, a bit scary to me when, when you're managing a crop that is really valuable to suggest eliminating all pesticide applications immediately, but obviously you've been successful in doing so. Yes, it's worked. It was really scary when we first started doing that. And, and so that's why I've kind of learned the, the, the few things that you have to be sure that gets accomplished. And that's getting the soil as healthy as you can and the plants as healthy as you can. And that's pretty hard to do with just one step off the cliff, but it can be done. Wow. Well, Michael, this has been very encouraging and very enlightening. Thank you very much for joining us here on this show. And uh, we will look forward to hearing from you again sometime soon in the future. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, John. I've enjoyed speaking with you. And uh, it's been challenging questions that you ask. So good luck with your venture. Thanks, Michael. This podcast was brought to you by a great company that I work for, Advancing Eco Agriculture, the leader in regenerative agriculture since 2006. At AEA, we believe in challenging the status quo to find more profitable and regenerative ways to grow. We also believe that healthy plants are resistant to pests and disease, and that to grow healthy plants, we must first think differently about agriculture, about empowering life instead of suppressing life, about regeneration versus degeneration. To achieve this, we formulate and sell products that help growers produce higher quality yields with less risk of crop failure. In short, we help growers make more money with less risk. If you are not yet an AEA customer, go to advancingecoag.com and use the code REGENERATE10 for 5% off your first order. Thank you for listening.